Hi, thanks for listening to today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. The fruit of the Spirit that we are focusing on today is patience. We are studying Galatians chapter 5. If you'd like to follow along with the Life Notes, you can download them now at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Robert Smith. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. And uh, while you're getting settled in, you can open up to the book of Galatians. Chapter 5 is where we're going to be at today. Galatians 5 as we continue our look at that book. And as you get settled in, uh, I got a text from Pastor Chad this morning. They've been down in Zambia for the last 10 days. He's got a group of about 16 or 17 with him and uh, had a little update that he wanted me to share with you guys. And over the last 10 days, they have uh, preached at five different churches. But through that, they've trained about 200 new celebrations recovery leaders as they launch Celebrate Recovery in that country uh, for the first time. And uh, they've had groups. Uh, I'm really excited about this part. They've, we've got a lot of young people on this trip, and they've got uh, a, several groups that are going and touring uh, schools, presenting, sharing their testimonies, preaching, and sharing the gospel in schools. They've shared uh, to about 10,000 students uh, over the last 10 days, and uh, I'm just excited for what God's going to do through uh, this work there in Zambia and how uh, we pray he will continue to multiply that effort. So I'm sure Chad will have more more for you next weekend. They're traveling back this week, and uh, so uh, I know he will have more to share, but we are continuing our study in the book of Galatians. We've uh, been in here for a little bit, but most specifically over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit, these nine character traits that God desires for us to live out and embody as his followers. And so if you have been memorizing these, you can say along with me. If you haven't, uh, you've got your Bibles open, Galatians 5 verse 22. It's is the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, against such things there is no law. And so we've got these character traits. And if you've been uh, tracking with me and following along, you know that we're on number four, which means tonight we get to talk about everyone's least favorite fruit of the Spirit, which is patience. Uh, and so I thought we'd do a little experiment here. We've never done this at Calvary. I'm going to preach a sermon that's twice as long so we can learn together uh, how to be patient. I'm kidding. Uh, you all get that, which is why you laughed. You didn't head for the door. But, but I, I think this is so interesting because you look at the other eight fruit of the Spirit, and so many of us love them, and we go, yes, we want that. We need more of that in our life. We look at patience, and we go, yes, I need more patience in my life. How many of you would agree that you need more patience in one or more areas of your life? Yeah, that's most of us. But if I were to turn the tables and say, how many of you desire to become more patient, I'm guessing we'd get less hands. I'm not going to ask for hands because I don't want to tempt you to lie in church. But but there's this tension where we know we want to be more patient, but we don't really want the process of becoming more patient. When you look at love, joy, peace, you look at kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these other ones, we're like, yeah, I'm willing to grow in that process, but there's something about patience where you go, I don't really want to do that. See, growing up, I, I heard this over and over again, these, these, and there's always the church ladies. They would always say, don't pray for patience, and they'd always kind of say it cutesy like that. And there was this unstated assumption after it, because if you do, all these bad things will happen that force you to become patient. And I don't know of any other thing in Scripture where someone has, has repeatedly said not to pray for something that God desires in your life. And I would say, just to set the record straight, this is an unbiblical, unhelpful statement that we're not going to perpetuate as truth here. We're going to say it just to point out how ridiculous it is. But I think the, the tension here is that we associate the process of becoming more patient just with the awful experiences of life. We think, well, if I'm going to grow in patience, that means that I need to, you know, I, I, I need to uh, go back to L.A. traffic. I need to sit in line, uh, you know, at, at Disneyland waiting for a ride, or I need to go to DMV while someone pays in pennies as their source of, you know, protest or something. Like, we just think of all these awful, miserable experiences that we'd rather just skip altogether. But what if we imagined a life full of patience defined by other things? Not by those miserable experiences we'd rather skip, but what if we thought of a life full of patience with positive things? What if we were patient and so we had healthier marriages because we fought less and we communicated better? 
What if we were able to lead and guide our children better because we spent less time irritated with them and more time understanding who they were and what their needs were? What if our job wasn't full of stress and frustration, but instead felt productive and meaningful? What if our life was less chaotic and spastic and instead it seemed like it had more clarity and direction? What if our life was defined less by stress and anxiety and instead was filled with peace and direction? And I think uh, d- despite what grabbed you in that, those list of possibles, I think they're all realities that are before us if we're willing to follow God and grow in patience. And I know that as we look at this, this is something that God desires for us to learn because uh, we are to be patient because God has been patient with us. And we're going to see that as we unpack this. And, and so we have to go, okay, what does this look like? How do we do that? How do we become people who are patient? And the first thing that we have to do is just submit to the fact that this is something that God desires for us. And, and we have to understand that we are required to learn patience. This isn't an optional thing for us. We don't get to say, well, I'm going to focus on the other eight uh, fruits of the Spirit, and I'm just going to skip that one. We don't get to choose peace or patience, love or joy, uh, gentleness or self-control. All of these things are part of God's required learning for our life. And so we have to address it as such. Where we, we don't get to bypass this, but instead we have to understand that this is something we are required to learn. We aren't naturally born with this. We aren't naturally born with any of the fruit of the Spirit, actually, which is why all of these are things that we have to go through a process of learning and refinement and sanctification as we grow in this. And so we get to choose then, are we going to do this willingly or unwillingly? Are we going to joyfully or reluctantly learn patience? Because God is committed to teaching us these things. And I don't know about you, but whenever I have to do something I don't really want to do, learning a little bit of the why helps me with that. Uh, You know, if if I can understand the why behind something, even if I don't like it, it makes it easier for me. So what I want to do is look at three ideas of why God cares about us living patiently. Why is this a big deal to him? And I hope that as, as I unpack these, and I'm sure there's other reasons why, but as I unpack these three, I hope that helps you go, okay, I'm willing to walk through this. And so the first why is that impatience is selfishness. Now, you may not think of it that way, but I think that any time we are impatient, we are operating in selfishness. It's us saying that that our needs, our desires, our priorities are more important than those around us. You get impatient in a long line at a store, it's because you think your time is more important than other people's time. You get impatient uh, behind that driver on the road. You think that your schedule and your destination is more important. You get impatient with your spouse. It's because they're not behaving the way you want them to behave or act. Our impatience is so often rooted in selfishness, which selfishness at its core is sin because it's us elevating ourselves to the place of highest importance. Whenever we uh, say that an act in selfishness, we're saying that we are the most important being that exists. When in reality, Jesus is the most important being that exists, and our life is to put him at the center and focus everything on that. And so I think that we need to begin seeing impatience for what it is. It's not just us not being self-controlled enough to be patient, but I think that selfishness is an indicator of us living selfish and self-centered lives in the world around us, not conforming to it. And so maybe the, the first step is you pivoting how you label it in your brain, and it's not you saying, oh, I'm being impatient, but it's maybe you just saying, I'm being unselfish in this moment. I'm being selfish in how I'm seeing this situation in this moment, and God doesn't desire for me to live a selfish life. So the first why behind this is that impatience is selfishness. The second is that patience is in God's character. The fruit of the Spirit is here to to bring God's character to bear in our life, to help us live more like our Savior in each way. And so each of these is reflected in God's character, and patience is is certainly one of them. As you look at God's character and and, 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 and nature, He is patient with us. Uh, I was thinking uh, on the Old Testament in Psalm 103, 8 says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. If you've read the Old Testament, you know that one of the phrases in there becomes just kind of baked into the narrative of the Old Testament, that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. 
Like this becomes almost the, the shorthand for who is the God of Israel. God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. When Jonah is frustrated because God doesn't destroy the city of Nineveh, he goes, I knew that you were a God who was slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Like this is, this is how they understood God. And it was his patience that was woven into all of that. And not just in their specific descriptions, but also in how God acted throughout history, we see that patience is woven into the storyline. Uh, and you look at the book of Exodus, the, the people of God were slaves in Egypt, and they had been for, for some time, and God worked through a series of events to set them free and bring them out into the desert. They were there longer than they wanted to be. Um, but this was a process of, of them getting their own nation, which became known as the nation of Israel. And so God works and does this miraculous thing and brings them out and he's providing for them, but they continued to grumble and complain and rebel and revolt against him. And God continued to show patience and grace and love towards them. Fast forward and they finally get their own nation and, and, and things are going great except they say, hey, we don't really want the God of the universe being our leader for our nation. We want to a human leader like the rest of the nation. So God, give us a guy to lead us because uh, you know, we know in this nation how well that can go. Um, and so God, God gives them the request. He grants them the request and, and it starts first with these leaders known as judges and you read the book of Judges and it's this painful cycle of them rebelling and sinning against God and destroying their nation and finally there's a, a righteous person that leads them and they finally start following him only to go back into rebellion and sin and throughout all of that God is patient and kind with them. And then you look at Jesus and he perfectly exemplifies this. Throughout so many situations, you see just incredible patience in the life of Jesus as he navigates difficult situations and needy people and religious leaders who are trying to, to pull him into traps. Jesus continued to serve the disciples even though they were thick-headed and impulsive and unloyal. Jesus allowed himself to be condemned and crucified and killed by people who made false accusations against him so that we could be saved. And see, the amazing thing is that the patience of God isn't just some theoretical thing that we read about in Scripture. The fact is, each and every one of us get to experience that firsthand. Because every single one of us has lived in sin and rebellion against the God of the universe, and yet He is patient towards us. Romans 2, 4 says, Do you presume on the riches of His kindness and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? See, the fact that we are here having an opportunity to come close to him, to find forgiveness, to be reconciled to our creator, shows the, the patience and love of God towards us. And this continues even after our initial salvation because when we become followers of Jesus, which means we believe that we are sinful, rebellious people and need a savior, we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose three days later, we've made a commitment to follow him with our life then the Bible says we become children of God. And that's amazing and encouraging that we've got this wonderful, loving, heavenly Father who wants to, to bless and help our life, but it also is maybe helpful to find the fact that sometimes we act like children. We become impulsive and selfish and self-centered and short-sighted, and all the things that frustrate us about children are how we act towards God. And he doesn't throw down lightning bolts, but instead continues to show patience and grace towards us as he loves us and guides us. And so as we look at this, we go, this is the heart of God towards us and towards all people throughout history. And if he desires for us to live like him, then the why is that we have to be patient like he is patient. Finally, as we look at some of these reasons, we understand that we have to be patient because patience shows love to others. In the same way that God's patience is how he communicates his love towards us, the world around us will know if we love them by our ability to be patient with them. In 1 Corinthians 13, there's an entire chapter that talks about the, the importance of having love for people and the, and the description of what love is. And if you've ever attended a wedding, I'm sure you've heard this passage because every wedding that I've ever been to or officiated, we talk about this. And, and Paul lists 15 descriptors of what love is, and he starts with love is 
patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. He continues in these 15 characteristics, but the first is that love is patient. See, if, if we want to, to love the people around us, it requires us being patient with them. I'm convinced that, that people's understanding of our capacity to love is directly correlated to our ability to be patient with them. And similarly, if we are followers of Jesus and desire to live that out, our ability to love people is what shows we're his disciples. It's what Jesus said in John 13, 35. He says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So I think it wouldn't be much of a stretch to say, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have patience one for another. Now, that's not what Jesus said, but if we are to love people, we have to be patient with them. So this is some of the why. These are some of the, the backgrounds of how, how is this that important? How is it that, that this is one of the most important characteristics of the nine total things? This is one of them. And I think this shows it. That living impatiently is, is selfishness, that God is patient with us. This is how we show love to people. So how do we get there? How do we be people who are patient? I think the way that we start to talk about this is by practicing patience. We can all see and likely admit that this is something we need, and maybe you are in a place where you're going, okay, I can reluctantly agree that I'm going to try and become more patient, and I'm going I'm to say yes to this. But the fact is, if you naturally struggle with this, you can't just flip a switch and become more patient. That situation or person that, that constantly presses your impatient button uh, isn't just going to stop tomorrow morning because you said, okay, God, I'm going to be patient now. But I think the way that we do this is by practice. The way that we get better at anything is by practice. So we're going to practice patience. And, and I don't know about you, but I had a, a little bit of a sports background growing up, and there was always these statements that the coaches would, would make. Uh, and I played a little bit of baseball, and so coaches would always say, hey, keep your eye on the ball. You know, hey, use two hands. You know, all, all these things that were repeated in that. They say, if you remember that, it will help you practice better. And so what I want to do is, talk about three things, and I think if we remember these three things, it will help us to practice patience better. And the first thing we need to do before we start talking about what other people are doing or how they're frustrating us or, or what we can do to deal with the, the annoyances of the people around us that are making us impatient is simply to, to pause and remember God's patience towards you. I know that we, we've touched on this a little bit, but if we want to grow at being patient, this has to be at the forefront of our mind. We have to remember that God is patient towards us. I want to read uh, 2 Peter 3.9. It says this. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The God of the universe is patient toward you. The God of the universe that you have sinned and rebelled against, that you have lived in defiance against, is patient towards you. And this is important for two reasons. One, it's the reminder that he is our example. He is our model that we're to follow after in every way. And so if we're going to follow his example, we have to be patient. But also, I think remembering the fact that the God of the universe is patient with us helps us to have some perspective in our life with the things, the situations, the moments that cause us to be impatient. It's probably because we're inconvenienced, we're offended, we're frustrated with something. But if we have some perspective of the fact that the God of the universe is patient with us, it'll probably help us be patient with those moments or situations that cause us to be impatient because in the grand scheme of things, they are far less significant than the ways that we have sinned and rebelled against God. And yet he has met us with patience and grace and mercy. So remember God's patience towards us, that that's how he wants us to live. It's the first thing that we need to remember. The second thing that I think we need to remember is that we need to remember others. And we need to remember that the people around us are also people with their own hurts, their own things that they're carrying, their own situations that are stressing them out, that are weighing them down. And the truth is that, that the people we're frustrated with are likely carrying things heavier and bigger than we imagine. 
And the thing that we often need to grow in patience is just an understanding of their context and a, a little empathy to their situation. I learned this several years ago uh, as the, the student pastor here. I had this, this high school student uh, who was, was super new to church. I mean, uh, so new that, that one night as I'm locking up the building and shutting the lights off and stuff, he's looking at me weird and he asked where I'm going. I said, I'm going home. And he was really confused because he thought all pastors just lived at the church. And I assured him that even though it felt like I lived here, I did not, in fact, live in this residence. So, so he's real new to church. Um, but he was not an easy student to have. He was regularly defiant and disruptive. He, uh, despite conversations about boundaries, things he needed to start doing, things he needed to stop doing, he didn't care. And one night, I was just over it. And I had decided in my head that tonight's the night I was gonna tell him he's kicked out of youth group. Like, it's gotta be pretty bad. You get kicked out of youth group. Like, you don't have to be here. It's an elective place. We're always like, anyone's welcome except for you. Um, like, it's pretty bad if you get to that point, right? But I'm like, this is the night. This is the last time that this is happening. And so we're, you know, we're kind of wrapping up and things are, are, are winding down. And he comes up to me, asks if we have any food. I'm like, bro, tonight is not the night to ask for a favor. He, and I'm like, no, we don't have any food left, or, you know, we don't have anything. And I go, why? And he begins to share how he was trying to, to make some plans because that morning, him and his younger brother had eaten the last of their ramen for breakfast, and they were trying to figure out what they were going to eat the next morning for breakfast because they didn't have any food in the house. And they're hoping that we would have something that they could take home and eat the next morning before school. And so I immediately go, oh, I need to actually slow down a second here and have a conversation. So me and my wife, Amber, we step aside and we go, what's going on here? And, and he begins to share that, you know, his home life is a mess. He hadn't ever met his dad because he was in prison. His mom was all over the place. Their household was a wreck. And we said, hey, I can't fix all of that, but we can go get you some groceries tonight. So we went over to Bash's. We got some groceries. We took them home, got them all set up. And that was a turning point in our relationship because now I knew what this kid was going through. I knew the baggage that he was carrying every Wednesday when he came here to youth group and why he was so frustrated and mad at the world around him. Now, it didn't make him any less of a punk. There were still all kinds of issues that happened. <laughs> but, but I noticed that the very moment that I understood the situation that he was going through, my capacity to be patient and compassionate toward him increased exponentially. And I think that the thing we all need to realize is there's people around us and they all have things going on. And, and the thing that we need to do more than, than not is to slow down and actually see the people around us. Because our lives are always so busy and overscheduled. We're running from one thing to another and we're impatient because people keep getting in our way. And maybe we just need to see the human on the other side of the situation and understand a little bit about their context and have the inability to be compassionate and patient towards them. Because when we ignore them and we live just pushing through and, and impatient with people, we're not living lives that are compatible with what God called us to do. And see, I wanna read a, a passage from the book of Philippians. If you've got Galatians open, if you flip a few pages over, you'll get to Ephesians, keep flipping a few pages, you get to Philippians chapter two. I'm gonna read a, a passage starting in verse three says this, it says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So often our impatience is because we live opposite of this. We live lives full of selfish ambition and conceit. We live lives always putting our own needs ahead of the needs of others. And if we wanna be patient followers of Jesus, we have to reverse this. And so today, begin to look to the needs of others and begin to, to listen to how Jesus lived differently than our natural desires and seek to follow after him. 
Finally, if we want to grow in, in practicing patience, we need to remember the call to wait. Throughout Scripture, we, we see all these examples of God telling his people to wait, to wait for him, to wait for his timing, to wait for God to work, to wait for God's action, but to wait, the thing none of us really like to do. I want to read a few passages here. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 37, 7, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We need to remember that sometimes God just desires for us to wait. And that's not always compatible with our timeline, with our agendas and schedules and what we want to do and the goals that we're trying to achieve in life. But sometimes he just has us in a season where we're to wait for him. We can learn a lot about him in the waiting. And, and if you're struggling in a season of waiting, maybe you just need to be reminded that it's worth the wait. See, Romans 8 says this. It says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for revealing of the sons of God. And not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we are saved. We wait for God to change things, to make all things right. And some of those things will happen in this life. We'll be able to see some of those things that, that God restores and makes new and aligns to be in perfection. And some of it we won't. But in the end, God wins. If we are in him, then we have the incredible hope of heaven. That, that no matter what our life looks like, no matter how long we have to wait for things to not be painful and difficult and tragic and frustrating, in the end, all things are perfect. And one day we'll be able to say, like the Apostle Paul, I consider the sufferings of this time are not worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed to us. But the choice is ours. Are we going to wait for the Lord? Are we going to choose to practice patience and eagerly wait for him and wait for how he's going to work and how he's going to guide our life? But to do this, we have to practice patience. Practice waiting on him, practice not placing our desires at the center of our life, but practice making following Jesus the desire of our life. And I believe that as we do that, we'll get to see our life change. We'll get to see God work and bring healthier marriages, better relationships, better workplace, more clarity, more power over stress and anxiety. But all this comes with us making the choice to say, I'm willing to grow in being patient. I want to be more like God and carry out his heart. So today I pray that you would seek to grow in patience because God has been patient with us. Let's pray together. God, we are an impatient people. Our world has, has solidified our desire to be impatient and get the things that we want now and not have to wait for them and wait for the, the fulfillment of our desires. God, so much of our world reinforces this instant desire, and yet so often you tell us to wait, to be patient, to be uh, willing to, to suffer for the long haul following you. And so, God, we come to you admitting that, that this desire you have for our life goes against so much of how we're wired. But, God, we remember that before you gave us the fruit of the Spirit in that same passage. You told us that the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. So God, we knew that this wouldn't be easy. But you, we ask that you help us. Help us to, to daily choose to, to reflect your heart and nature to the world around us by being patient and kind to those around us. Help us to be people who, who don't seek to, to satisfy our own desires, but instead elevate your desires. Help us to see the people around us, not just as inconveniences that slow us down, but help us to see them as opportunities to love and to serve and to show your heart to them. God, we are impatient. 
Help us to see that for what it is and help us to choose to follow you and to surrender in the process of becoming more patient. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While growing up, did you ever hear the statement, patience is a virtue? I certainly did. The premise behind that is that waiting calmly is a good trait. It's one of the virtues that the Holy Spirit grows in our lives as we walk in the Spirit. If impatience is a sign of selfishness and you know that you need more patience, remember God's patience with you and ask Him to help you prioritize others' needs above your own. If you have questions or want prayer, visit calvaryaz.com forward slash connect and fill out a connect card. One of our pastors will contact you and pray with you this week. Well, that's all for today. Join us next week when we will speak about kindness. Bye-bye.